Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 407. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. This week's interview is with Dr. Pippa Malmgren. Pippa is an economist and an award-winning author who served President G.W. Bush in the White House and on the National Economic Council. She's focused on simple sense-making of the world economy and all its complexities. She was a founder of a firm in the drone autonomy space that won a 2020 COGX Award and the 2020 National Technology Award. And Pippa's been named a leading woman in tech by We Are Tech Women and the top 50 women in tech by Accelerate Her. In this conversation with Pippa, we talk about a number of critical issues for leaders. We unpack what it means to be an infinite leader in some very insightful ways to change the leadership styles. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com Please do consider dropping your rating and review, and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show with Pippa. Dr. Pippa Malgram, what a pleasure to have you on the show. I got a chance to come across your book because we have both had the privilege of being privileged by Kogan Page. You have been published by them at least two times, as far as I understand, under the imprint Inspire. Your last book is what I really wanted to talk to you about, but you've written other leadership books. Uh, this one is called The Infinite Leader, Balancing Demands. Uh, let's see, let me see, where, 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 I've, I've lost where the title is. Yeah, The Infinite Leader, Balancing the Demands of Modern Business Leadership. Great book. So um, in your own words, Peppa, how would you like to describe yourself? Oh, well, I'm, it's so good to see you. It's so fun to do this. Uh, I'm an economist, but I like to express that in lots of different ways. So I've advised the president of the United States and the British government, but I've also launched tech companies because uh, I think it's important to be part of the real economy and not just talking about it. And leadership is so central to what happens in the world economy. And in recent years, we've had a lot of leadership catastrophes. So I wanted to write about why I thought that was and uh, so I'm a core, I'm an economist, but, but I like to be involved in lots of different things. So I love the fact that you have practiced what you've preached as opposed to just writing and telling what everyone else should do. What would you say, A, would be the key learning or learnings that you had actually doing the business and, and how much of that was configured into what you write? Oh, a lot. Uh, and it's a very iterative process. But, you know, you, it's one thing to, to, to study, for example, do an MBA or to study politics, but to actually be in that boxing ring, oh, that's a whole different thing. That's the MBA money can't buy or the PhD money can't buy. And what I've learned is that they're just people at the end of the day. It doesn't matter whether you're dealing with the president of the United States or the CEO of a company, they're humans. And... So how to best interact with humans and the old model of the leader knows all the answers and tells everybody else what to do doesn't work. And so coming up with a way that you can bring out the best in the other person and even gifts and skills they might not even know they have, that's, that's the juice. So the name of the book, I'm just, I have to imagine you and Chris, your co-author, um, you, is it, not possible. You could have called it the zero leader. It you is, write so uh, much about zero and infinite. We did. And, and, and of course, I'm imagining that zero doesn't sound so hot. So infinite goes positive. How did that go down between you? That, that was exactly it. And that was a, a Kogan page call because they understand the audience well. And they're like, you can't talk about zero leadership. And, and on my view and Chris as well, we were like, but that's all everybody's talking about is how we have zero leadership. <laughs> which in the sense is true but look uh, in the end the point that um we're really trying to make is that whenever you see a zero whenever you feel we have no money we have no possibility we have no option it's a big zero remember that a zero is not just a number if you if you see it as a number that's your analytical mind at work but if you turn to the other side of your brain and use your creative mind a zero is a symbol it's a circle and throughout the millennia, a circle has stood for possibility and cyclicality and endless openings to do new things. And in fact, 
if you reframe, if you kind of twist any, any problem that seems to be a zero and you look at it just a bit differently, you can literally convert it into an infinity symbol and create infinite possibility out of what seems like an absolutely zero, nothing to work with situation. But it's an imaginal exercise, not an analytical exercise. And most of our leaders have been trained to be analytical and not creative and use their imagination. Yeah, and it seems to be that that's the, the big thing, and especially when you go to business schools, it's about effectiveness, efficiencies, bringing in the numbers and this messy shit, as you were mentioning before, of human beings, ah, what a pain in the butt. Get me a, ro- get me a robot, program that, give me the numbers and this imagination stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, even the zero, as you say, really, as you write a lot about, uh, developed or invented, if you will, in, in the seventh century, it's kind of a concept. It is and... a concept. Numbers are a concept. Mm. And that's the thing, how much credence do we give to these concepts? Look at the whole economics profession. It's built on the concept that you can mathematically model reality, <laughs> but you can't, I mean, you can make a kind of rough estimate, but humans, it turns out, behave very different ways given the same stimulus uh, there's so little predictability. So again, it's easy to be analytical uh, and to make the numbers add up, but humans never behave that way. So, and let's face it, the best businesses do have people at the top who get this creativity aspect. I mean, Steve Jobs may have created the world's greatest computers, but what he really understood was that he was not selling computers. He was selling the ability to use your imagination to create using one. That's a whole different thing. When he went to Scully and he said, do you want to continue selling sugary water? Or do you want to change the world? Yeah. That is pure genius. So you write um, leadership that balances between positives and negatives, between competing forces, between conflicting objectives and interests. That is what we have called the infinite leader. And, and so you, you seem, you're putting in this place the idea that we need to have this balance is what we call for. And I was thinking, is it not some sort of basically this balance, a, a way of reconciling our paradoxes, uh, even our opposing forces, life and death, knowledge and doubt, rational and irrational? That's definitely part of it. And as Chris and I were writing, we were creating little gifts to show what these competing forces are. But in addition to that, maybe another easier way to think about it is what is the nature of the task? And most leaders, whether in politics or business or in any context, they seem to think that the the task is like going to Mount Everest, that you've decided the target and it's fixed and it's there. And now you just need the right equipment and the right team and enough determination and you'll get there. But what if it's more like surfing? What if it's more like being out in the open ocean and you have all these conflicting forces and the weather keeps changing and you, the, the thing coming towards you might be a dolphin, but it might be a shark. Like you don't know. And your job is to stay on that board. Now that I think is a better description of what it means to be a good leader and to be good at balancing. I grew up surfing, so it's a natural hmm. Uh, analogy for me, but that balancing process is very different from the hike to the top of Mount Everest. And I think if we had more leaders that knew how to balance, like on a balance board, we would get better leadership outcomes. Hmm. The interesting point I'm thinking of as you say that is I tend to think of of a surfer as a very individual experience, where and of course climbing is as well. But I, I, it feels like you can't climb a big climb without somebody. There's more teamwork and a sense of confidence in others as you're grappling with the, the mountain face. But no. So I spent my summers uh, in L.A. surfing and surfers are always in, in. Well, they call them gangs, really. They're, they're groups with a lot of sticky adherence. There are close friendships. And nobody goes surfing by themselves because you get lost and nobody knows you're gone. So you always are with a partner and usually surfers are in a gang and they kind of watch after each other. They get very territorial about which part of the surf is theirs and they don't like other outsiders coming in. 
But the point is they operate definitely as a unit. And this is an important idea because one of the things that Chris and I say, which sounds a little bit corny, but I think it's accurate, is the word leadership. It used to be about the leader, the brilliant, all insightful, all knowing leader. But now we've realized it's really about the ship. It's about the, all of the people who are on that team or in that community or part of the um, overall community of, of, of that the company or the policy will affect, the stakeholders as we call them today. And getting the best out of that group is the key to good leadership. It's not a thing that only one person exercises. Leadership is something that everybody exercises. It makes me think of my interview I had with David Marquet, who was a commander of a nuclear submarine, 160 people. So it's not a, it's not a ship, it's a submarine, mm -hmm. uh, but very much that idea of, of you need all 160 people. They all have a role and each of them needs to contribute and, and have the autonomy to, to do what's needed without having to wait for, which is what he really discovered, his order to do, because by the way, they're the best at doing what they do. He doesn't, in this case, the, this the leader. So one of the things that was funny, I was expecting you to write um, as, as your subtitle about this balance idea, about life work balance or work life balance. Tell me how you manage that, Pippa. What's your opinion of that balance? Because it's oftentimes talked about a lot of burnout uh, not everybody is enjoying the work. What about this life thing? Yeah, and that's the usual metric for thinking about it. And actually, Chris and I, interestingly, didn't get that much into work-life balance. We got more into, in both the last books on leadership, more into the idea that you need to love what you're doing. And then it's fun and it's interesting. And the line between what is work and what is not starts to blur in such a way that you don't remember that actually you're working or that having fun is occurring in the workspace, which actually means people are working harder and better because it's fun. You know, um, Chris always says quite rightly that um, uh, your, your proficiency with anything follows your preference. So if you like doing whatever it is you're going to be good at it and if you don't like what you're doing get out go do something else and this is the thing with leadership uh that you know the the infinite leader was very much about how leadership is not a thing that's exercised by that person over there with the big title it's something you do and in leading your own life if you're not having fun at work what do you do in there and if your work is not exciting and engaging, why are you spending so much time doing that? So the work-life balance tends to fade away if you're really aligned in the right way. So this is really where I wanted to go with this because I have a vision that your ability to trust somebody uh, is not just on their talent at executing in a work plan. It's a personal conviction. It's a personal feeling of trust. So then the question is, if someone says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm very unhappy outside of work. Work is everything for me. That's the first part. And then the second part is, if I'm operating and acting in a different way in my personal life than I am at work, is that a good thing? These are great points and the answer is no. For the first one, for the simple reason that it turns out that most people have their great epiphanies when certain circumstances are present and they are number one, they are not at work. Number two, they are not working. They're not trying to solve that problem. What they're usually doing is lying in the bathtub or taking a walk with the dog or hanging out with friends or quietly reading a book. And in those moments, that's where you get the aha, the epiphany, the moments where I think the subconscious is free enough to speak to your consciousness 
uh, that suddenly the answer crystallized. You go, oh my God, I have the answer. I know what to do. Now, what do we do at work when we have a big problem? Do we send people away and say, go spend some quiet time? No, we go, let's have more meetings, right? It's the, uh, let's do more papers. Let's do more work. And it's the opposite of what is actually required for truly imaginative leaps that are going to get you where you want to be. And it's hard because when you take people who are really good at what they do, they feel like they're skiving off if, if you tell them to go wander off and spend some quiet time. And I love the, the, the guys in the Formula One world talk about this. And they say they work to 80% mental capacity at any given time and only 80% because they know there's an accident that's going to happen. For sure, it's coming, they just don't know when. And therefore you need the 20% of your bandwidth to deal with it when it arrives. Well, if we ran the White House this way, if we ran businesses this way, I bet you we'd get better results, more resilience. But as it is, it's hard to say to people, listen, keep 20% of your time full of nothing, just, just available for, for epiphanies and future problems. So usually you got to tell them, well, go fill it with something you think is going to be the coming new issue because they just feel like they're going to get fired if they're not working 100% of the time. We had this um, tendency when I was at L'Oreal, we would always say it was a, called a seminaire ouvert, which means go go do some green stuff. And But what that actually meant was we go to a beautiful chateau, mm -hmm. lots of pomp and circumstances. Uh, there's maybe a champagne on arrival. All right, uh, all right, we'll see you in the meeting in 20 minutes. And that is all you see of the chateau. For the rest of the time, you're stuck in the room. You look outside, there's this beautiful sprawling lawn, tennis court, swimming pool, which you won't touch unless it's on your sleep hours. And, and so this whole idea of you know, the, the real re rest of the, the cognitive load, that doesn't really happen out there. So the, the other point that I was ad addressing was the trust in somebody. And, and I, I have a, a line in my mind that says, I think women get this a lot more than men. But if the, the individual outside of work doesn't operate in a way that seems trustworthy, for example, has a, a beautiful family and two mistresses. Mm. Is that relevant in a work environment? Yeah, and it's more relevant now because social media has made the world vastly more transparent. It's much more difficult to lead a life where what you do and what you say are different. And we've seen a lot of corporate failures, leadership failures because of this. The one example that we use in The Infinite Leader was WeWork, um, where Adam Neumann, the then CEO, uh, had a policy- And co-founder. And the co-founder, yeah, who created it. Uh, and had a policy that uh, everybody's lunch would be paid for as long as it was vegetarian. And then it seems that they were ordering, you know, burgers in the C-suite. Now, normally this is a small thing, you know, it's okay, people eat burgers in America. But to say you stand for protecting the environment to the point that you'll only pay for vegetarian lunch, but the C-suite is behaving very differently, what it does is it creates a crack of doubt. And this is super dangerous because people really feel whether you are authentic and consistent. And so the gap between uh, what you say and what you do really matters much more now. And I go a little bit further and say that most people can, they'll definitely have a to-do list, but what they won't have is their to-be list because you can only be your values. You can't really do your values. And so the question is, are you being the values that you say you stand for? And if you're not, trust in you is, is eroding all the time. Hmm. I love it. One of the funny things you, you, you talk about there is this idea of doubt. And so doubt is not good when you're talking about trust. And at the same time, this is the, the lovely elements of words are the way they are. And when you write, you talk about the need to be able to doubt. Um, because if you're a know-it-all, you know, sure, I got all the knowledge and all this, and this whole idea of, of doubt and the exploration of the things I don't know. So it's just funny how certain words in certain contexts 
are valuable and in others are not so hot when we're talking about trust. So um, you, you, another thing you talk about in, in the book uh, a fair amount, and, and I, I really, I, my, my ears perked up, spirituality and religion. So I would like for you to explain what was going through you and Chris's mind when you're talking about, to what extent is, is spirituality part of being the infinite leader and what part of that is religion? Yeah, let's start with a, a very elegant quote that I like by a fellow called Teilhard de Chardin, who was writing in the 1930s and 40s. He was a Jesuit priest and an archaeologist, um, and he was nearly excommunicated by the church for saying this line, which was, we are not, um, we are not humans having a spiritual experience. We are spirits having a human experience. And you know, at the time, this was considered radical. But I think that we can all understand that everybody is a spirit. They have, you know, their soul contains certain gifts and whims and contradictions and interesting, quirky things. And everyone is trying um, to live within these, you know, human containers that we have been given, and interface with other humans and their containers. And so. If you think of it that way, you you bring less judgment, more open heartedness, uh, and it goes further than that. What if the people on your team have marvelous spiritual gifts that you're not taking advantage of? And the one I really love is is a COVID example. When COVID first started, there's apparently a museum in the states, uh, and it's literally the Cowboy Museum. Right. And I'm not into cowboys, but apparently, you know, it's a big deal for some people. Anyway, nobody was able to keep the Twitter account going because everybody was home with COVID. So some guy who is the security guard for the cowboy museum said, oh, me, me, I'd like to do it. I'll do it. And he had no background whatsoever in social media. And anyway, he went on to Twitter and he didn't know how to even write stuff. So he started to talk in such a heartfelt way about the this costume that John Wayne wore on this film and why that film was a big deal. And then he said, and then my grandson tells me I have to write hashtag. So he writes out the word hashtag, right? And everyone falls in love with this spirit who loves cowboy stuff. And they had a massive success and got many more followers than if they'd had somebody professional doing it. So how many of us in our organizations have some joyful spirit who just loves whatever it is and we wouldn't dream of giving them the Twitter account, but actually that might be the wisest thing to do. And that's the element of spirit that we were trying to get at. It wasn't really so much religion um, or spirituality with a capital S. It was more about understanding the spiritedness of humans and their human condition. Well, I, I tend to, my, my maybe proxy for that word spirit with a small s is energy mm. and, and uh, where are the energies and, and in, a, in a future book, maybe talk about our link with consciousness oh, and, 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 and a bigger element of spirituality there, sort of a smallness, that sort of con the subconscious that you were talking about with our consciousness and making that a little bit more explicit in the idea. So we're just talking about spirituality and religion, which I was in my little narrative, my mind was, these are topics you don't talk about at work. Um, so in the, in the realm of other things you don't talk about, you probably don't talk about sex and you don't talk about politics until now. What, what's your opinion of the place of politics as a leader in a workplace? Let's just stick with the idea of, of an enterprise where you're working, let's say it was startup or, or you know, company. Yeah. And uh, let me just, before answering that, I would like to add one more word, which we do talk about in the book and everyone is shocked. And it's if, same idea. What place does this word have in this context? The answer is love. So I'll mm, come to that yeah, I love that. Love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in politics, look, everybody is involved in politics. Now, if you're building it, for example, any sort of company, um, particularly in the tech space, you're really having to make decisions about, do I stand with Twitter, Google and Amazon or an Apple for cutting off 
uh, Donald Trump or do I believe that everybody should have access to the internet and platforms and free speech? You can't duck and dive these questions anymore. They're right in your face. They're bigger too. They get you into geopolitics. If you were building a tech company, are you going to have Chinese coders, Chinese component parts? Um, if yes, then you're gonna find yourself on one side of a very important geopolitical divide. So, and the same with Russia, the same, like all, geopolitics is playing itself out in the business community. In a sense, we're in a kind of a new cold war. And so everyone in business feels this, every bank, uh, most nations are having to make a decision. Are we with the Chinese or are we with the Americans? You know, playing both sides isn't so easy anymore. So um, yeah, and being able to manage a workforce that will have very divided opinions. I mean, in the US, for example, the hottest growing labor force in the US is in Texas and in Austin, particularly, I think that's the new Silicon Valley of the United States. Now you're gonna have a lot of Californians there who have a very liberal attitude and they hate uh, not just Donald Trump, but the Trumpers. And let's face it, there's 70 million of those guys, those people right now. And you're gonna have a bunch of Texans who think that the Trumpers absolutely have it right. How are you gonna manage a workforce if you're taking sides? You, you need to be able to understand that people will have differences of opinion and the managing of that is a leadership skill and now a, a really required leadership skill. So, and it's so tough to do when you have, you only have two choices in, in the political spectrum in the United States. It, it seems more obvious, I would say, when you have multiple parties, because you are by nature having to negotiate even to get into power. So there's always a to and a froing and overlapping. And, but uh, in the United States, you have to be in one camp or the other, even though, as far as I'm concerned, the, the list of, of policies behind each party make no sense, or at least <laughs> there are plenty that cross over. And so I, I was wondering, you don't really touch on it in the book, but how does, but your role with politics in the past this is why I wanted to ask you, how does leadership change as when we're talking about the infinite leader, when it comes to being a leader of a political party, or to take another area, the leader of a charity or an NGO, where the, the game, the, the, the numbers game is different? Well, I think the first thing is that the problem is the binary mindset, the either or. Uh, we saw it in Britain with everybody was asking me, you know, post Brexit, is Britain successful or the EU successful? Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is, why can't it be both? We have more than 170 countries in the world, many of which are successful at the same time. Why can't they both be successful using different business and political models? Uh, and so I think one of the leader's tasks is to move away from the binary effort to predict. And this gets back to the point you raised earlier about certainty being a dirty word for, for leaders. Because when you're certain and you say it's Trump will never win or Brexit will never happen. This kind of certainty is what trips everybody up. And it's the, it's the sure origin of mediocrity in your performance. What makes much more sense is preparedness for a range of possible outcomes. And let's face it, in the last few years, all the impossible stuff is what actually happened. So learning how to play with scenarios and say, well, what if such and such actually happened? And to stop putting or in and add and, what if we had this and that at the same time? And suddenly you'll find you're not in such a face-off with people that disagree with you or you disagree with. I mean, one of the big dangers of the current environment, social media uh, exacerbates this, is this simple idea that either you agree with me or there are only two possibilities. You're either evil or you're an idiot. Okay, this is not conducive to civil dialogue and civil society. So a leadership task is to add in the word and, and to how to become more inclusive. I love it. Uh, I actually, I, I usually talk about it in the replacement of the word, but. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the word love before, so I want to get back to that. 
Um, and I was going to frame it in the idea that you talk about, and I love this, this idea of the skill of conversation as a leader. I, I don't know if they're necessarily associated, but riff on for me, Pippa, the place of love in business and the skill of conversation. Yes. It's so interesting because when you first raise this, everyone's like, what, Harvey Weinstein? You think that, you know, it's okay to have sexual overtures in the office? And you're like, isn't that interesting? You associate the word directly with sex. Um, <laughs> what, what we were meaning to say about love is that actually as a driver of behavior, it's very powerful. So what is the one institution that's run entirely on love? The military. And people go, what? What do you mean the military? Well, what are people there for? It's not the paycheck. It's patriotism, which is love of country. And if you talk to the guys who are either in the SAS or the Navy SEALs, they will tell you that the principal criteria for getting into those organizations, it's not how strong you are or how tough you are or how smart you are. It is, are you able and consistently uh, wanting to put the life of your colleague ahead of your own, your, your willingness to value the other person to the point that you'll never leave them behind. And what is that? That's a kind of love. Oh, um, sure. C.S. Lewis wrote a marvelous book called The Four Loves, uh, where he talks about the different kinds, you know, and some of it's about friendship and some of it's about the love of a child. Some of it is about romantic love. And I think our definition of love needs to be widened out. If you're running an organization, it should matter to you whether the people in your organization are thriving in it. Are they able to find and exercise their gifts and abilities? Do you have enough love for their future, for their ability to be the full person they're capable of being? And if you don't care and you view everybody as just a totally replaceable Lego piece, you're gonna have a completely different sense of camaraderie and, and corporate ethic. So mm. how much love you have for whatever it is really matters. The, the recent, there was a, um, I'm just flaking now for a second, but there's a, the CEO of one of the world's biggest brand names. Um, he put climate change and his love of the planet as the principal driver of decision-making and so he attracted all these people who really cared about that, who loved this idea, and then created extraordinary outcomes. Uh, so love definitely is a word that belongs in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. And it's the last word any board wants to hear. So uh, I've got on my guest, I guess, coming up, uh, a woman, uh, Dr. Yatunde Hoffman, who's written about the, the role of love in business. So exactly that topic. And it doesn't surprise me that this word is, uh, this concept is coming from you, Peppa, and uh, Yatunde, a woman as well. Uh, and it's fully uh, justifiable. Oh, I still want to get back to conversation, but the, the, the concepts I want to touch about here for having done history like you a lot. Um, and, and I interviewed 130 veterans of the Second World War for my film and my book they didn't really talk about patriotism. They just thought that that was their duty. What they did love was their band of brothers, just like you say, and, and it was that, that element. And then the projects were to conquer this hill. The, the point that I wanted, and I, I spoke with David Marquet about this a lot, which is the notion of purpose. It's, so how do you describe the role of the infinite leader in, in creating that purpose? Is it just about encouraging love? How do you get that to happen? Yeah, well, and this knits back into your question about conversation, uh, because the way that you create the cohesive sense of purpose is the conversation that you're having with the team, with the stakeholders, with the customers. I mean, in a way, a brand logo is a conversation. It's an image that encapsulates what you stand for. What is the purpose of the organization? That's, by the way, one reason that so many brand logos are circles. Back mm. to the circle being a symbol of um, wholeness and, and reliability and trust. So that's a question. How do you converse with all these people as a leader? 
And do you really speak to them? I remember when I worked at Bankers Trust back in the 90s as a young, you know, young person on the trading floor, the chief executive of the bank used to swing through London and he'd come walk around the trading floor and he'd come up behind you and he'd tap you on the shoulder and he'd sit down next to you and say, and he, and he would know your name and he would say, Pippa, what are your thoughts today about what's happening in the market? And you're like, oh, you know, terrified. But he really wanted to know, what did you think? So you'd start to tell him. And he had this wonderful sense that you could tell him that he wasn't going to judge you. He was literally trying to learn from you. And so you knew that there was a conversational entree into the chief executive. And that created immense confidence. Whereas I worked for another organization where the chief executive would get into the elevator. And if anybody else got into the elevator, he'd glare them out. Um, a bit like that uh, character in the, the film about Vogue, right? And as a result, everyone knew it didn't matter how bad it got. There were no circumstances where anyone could have a conversation with the chief executive and they got into a lot of trouble uh, eventually. So the conversational element is not just about the practical information that you pull from a person or convey. It's also the whole atmosphere of openness that you are fostering. Mm. As opposed to like the know-it-all, it's like, tell me your opinion. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. I'm going to value your opinion. Absolutely, completely. And again, the CEOs and, and politicians who say, I already know. Yeah, this is not a strong leadership uh, you know, life is life is full of messinesses and impossibilities, apparently, as you were saying. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about, you have a whole chapter about the, um, or at least a piece about role models. And it does strike me when I, when people say to me, hey, who's, who's a great model of a leader for you? I'm like, mm, well, no one's perfect, uh, right? So it just becomes a story that you talk about. And in the context of the lack of role models, you, you talk a lot about education and the failing of schools to provide us with the education necessary, it seems. That's what was all I interpreted of your book. When you were talking about that, is, do you feel that the experiences of schools need to change? You know, and specifically, is that targeted towards the US or is that more global in your opinion? Yeah, this is a great question. So. Um, a couple of things. First of all, Chris and I asked ourselves this question, right? Who are the great leaders? Hmm. And we really had to rack our brains. And we finally were like, well, you know, you might, you probably see more genuine leadership being exercised by a single parent running a family home than you do by the US federal government. I mean, more fiscal discipline, more commitment to making sure that everybody on the team ends up in the right place. I mean, and why don't we applaud the, the, the single parent in a, of a family as a leader example? Why does it have to be you're running a mega global enterprise? And by the way, how many people are running really great going concerns that are never going to be a unicorn or Silicon Valley, but they make money and they do what, something that's valuable in the community. And so maybe our orientation to bigger, better, best, it has to be huge in order to be valuable is wrong. And that we should value people who have just good nous more than we do. Um, and so that's where we began with this concept of you know, who is a good leader. Mm -hmm. um, education comes into it because look, for a million reasons, including that technology has changed so dramatically and COVID has accelerated the online learning capacity of everyone on the planet. So basically we're no longer in a world where you're supposed to have all the information in your head by the time you're say either 18 or 22 and then you never go back to school again, right? You're done. No, now we're in lifelong learning. And in addition, I, I have a theory too, that in the past, being a specialist is what paid. And that now because of technological change for a whole bunch of reasons, being a polymath, being someone who can cut across different silos, 
uh, who can connect the dots between different areas of endeavor, this is more valuable. And that's not what the education system really teaches. So education is not only lifelong, but it's less about the deep dive into the specialization and more about the broad reach across the landscape. Well, that's highly reassuring for me, Pippa. I feel like I've done a million things, but I'm good at nothing. So this is, um, this is they call it the, the comb principle. We have a little bit of knowledge uh, across a broad depth swath of things. So I, I wanna finish with one last question. I hope it's not a, uh, you know, an ambush. Um, do you have amongst the books that you've read in leadership, any of them that uh, stand out as something that really impacted you or that you would uh, immediately want to recommend to people other than of course, your wonderful books. <laughs> I actually, I'm gonna give you a, a different answer than I think you're expecting. I, I did look at a lot of leadership books when we were writing and we, we kind of felt like it's a lot of the same old, same old. I mean, I kind of mm. heard this before. What I realized is that reading outside of that discipline is more valuable, at least for me. And mm. so I'm reading a lot about um, sociology and history and psychology and um, just a lot of things that give me a better sense of the human condition. Art, anthropology. I have to say, anthropology. I have to say art. If there's one subject I have to recommend to leaders, it is art. And people will be like, wait, what? Because we think of art as a thing that you buy once you're wealthy and then you usually buy it because it's a store of value and you'll make more money later. But no, art, I think both um, Ezra Pound and Marshall McLuhan both quite rightly said that artists are the radar of society mm. and they see what's coming way before everybody else. And because they're fundamentally creative, right? They're using the other side of the brain, not the analytical, but the imaginal side it's incredibly helpful for analytical people to skip over to that side and see the world through their eyes. I'll give you just a quick example. I remember in the Paris catwalk shows of 2018, uh, they started to show at Prada and other places, literally riot gear, like padded vests as if you were gonna go to a riot. And as an economist, I'm like, hey, we've got the conditions for riots to start happening. And now we've got the artists showing us what to wear to the riot. I think we're going to have protests. Sure enough, within 24 months, we got protests. So good leaders need good situational awareness of what is going on in the world. And one of the best ways is look at what the artists are trying to tell you about the state of society, because they really see stuff before anybody else. So that we'll finish on that because what it says to me, Pippa, is that whether it's leadership, we also tend to apply this idea to marketing, but branding, it's a combination of art and science. So they have to find the balance between those two things to become the infinite leader. Pippa, how can someone follow you, get your book, any of the other good stuff that you'd like to be put in links? Oh, how marvelous. Thank you. I think you're a great podcast host. So you, you have lots of gifts. Uh, I'm on Twitter and social media under at Dr. Pippa M because no one can spell or pronounce Malmgren. Uh, and I'm on LinkedIn and the book is on Amazon and Kogan Page is the publisher. And we're both Chris and I are super open to having dialogue on social media platforms about these ideas. Beautiful. Pippa. Dr. Malgram means sutta flicka, bring out all my Swedish. Thank you so much for being on the show. Keep going, stay strong, and uh, keep keep up the wonderful uh, direction and work, and and bring some balance to this work and life of being a leader. Thank you so much. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find all the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. And if you enjoyed the show please head over to Apple Podcasts to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. I like the feel of 
a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger to feel free. Trust is a reason. Still, I won't tell the lie. I sit here passively, hope for your respect, anticipating the thrill of your intellect. Maybe I tell myself. In me lying. I'm a convinced man building an urge. I'm a convinced man to live and die submerged. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man challenge my fate. I'm a convinced man competitions in me. A convinced Of a woman, despise revenges and struggle with deceit. Live for the challenge, so life's not incomplete. What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die. I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me, precipitating the danger. Trust in my reason and let me show you why. I'm a convinced man practicing my lines. I'm a convinced man here in these confines. A convinced man in the arms of a woman. I'm a convinced man fit to the test. I'm a convinced man. I'm ready for an arrest. I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman.